Grand Cathay. Good holding infantry, covered by good missile units and artillery, and decent cavalry, all benefiting from the other's presence. I'll show every unit from the Grand Cathay roster before and after research, redline skills, and XP. I'll also speak out about the lords and heroes and their abilities in campaign. So, as an example of what I'll showcase here, uh, this is the Fire Rain Rocket before and after every upgrade in the game. So, research, XP, redline skills, that's the, the main idea here. So, this hopefully can uh, showcase how the unit will become better, and therefore you can make a better decision in terms of the composition that you will want in the end game, because you will be aware of how the units will look like a little bit better in the end game. Speaking of the army, you do have great holding infantry, great missiles and artillery, good flying units, a good single entity, the one you have is really remarkable, good magic users, but they are weak in anti-large outside of the infantry, that's one of their main weaknesses. Now, in specific, they are also really good, especially when they are combined, because of the uh, yin and yang mechanic. So, in terms of harmony, you have the yin and the yang. The yin mechanic is an increase of speed, reload skill, and leadership of any missile unit or unit with the yin mechanic. Uh, there's an intensity that can be enhanced by some harmony multipliers. As you can see, the intensity here, for instance, is 200%, so they're gaining a little bit more. And similarly, we have the Yan mechanic. It's a leadership, melee defense and melee attack buff when a Yin unit is nearby. Same in terms of intensity, it is enhanced with harmony multipliers. What this means is that the Cathay army benefits from having both Yin and Yang units working together and enhancing their combat stats for the greater purpose. Adding to this, some units do have a formation attack, they will try to stay in formation when in melee and the melee defense will be slightly increased, and in addition to that they will have a defensive stance. This is enabled when not moving, so basically if they are bracing, they'll get a charge resistance plus 10% uh, in the first 10 seconds, and then it is unlimited as long as they do not move, they get 25% uh, charge resistance and more armor. Useful, of course, when you need to stand down and defend a specific location without moving, then they'll become much better, much more resistant. So we begin with Miao Ying, the Storm Dragon, a spellcaster but also a melee expert. With a mixed lore of yin and lore of life, she's amazing in single combat by herself, tons of hint points, good melee attack and melee defense and also magical attacks. She has a good weapon strength but not a lot of armor piercing in this form at least, and still good charge bonus and speed. Now of course the main idea from her is that she can also transform into a dragon. And as a dragon, it gives her more armor, more speed, uh, a little bit less melee defense, but much better armor-piercing weapon strength. So, in essence, it changes her slightly. Uh, in specific, you should notice that the spells change as well. So she gets a nice vortex, the talents of the night, but uh, doesn't have access to the other spells, so be wary of that. In addition, she also gains terror, which is always nice to have on any unit. So, a good uh, uh, melee caster-hero combo for your... Uh, army, basically. So for her abilities in campaign, she does have the transformation of the dragon. Guess what? It basically turns her into a dragon, if you're not paying attention. So we also have Wrath of the Storm, affecting allies in range, giving ma magical attacks and melee attack, as well as immunity to psychology. We also have Mastery of the Elemental Winds. This increases the power of spells when two or more units share this attribute, so it's always good to bring a couple of uh, units that have this so that the spells get better, basically. You also have Disdain of Dragons. This affects ground enemy units in range with its a hex area of minus melee, uh, 8 melee attack in this case. And then we have another one that is actually for when she is in a dragon form, which is the Aura of Majesty. It reduces melee defense if the enemy in range is actually a flying unit. Only lords or heroes, of course. Uh, then we have the... Um, where is it? Oh, the Eye of the Storm. My apologies. This is also in dragon form. It gives more that weapon damage, more melee attack, but only if it, the entity is a uh, large or flying entity. Right. 
and flying entity. I believe it needs needs to be both large and a flying entity. Zhao Ming, the Iron Dragon, also a spellcaster, but with the mixed lore of Yang and lore of metal. Zhao is also great in single combat. Tons of hit points as well, good armor values, uh, more melee defense than melee attack, slightly different than Yao Ying, and still the same good weapon strength, not a lot of armor piercing. He's fast, but lacks a little bit the charge bonus uh, compared to Miao Ying. Now, he can also turn into a dragon, which gives him... Dragon form gives him more armor, levels up the melee attack and defense values, and much more weapon strength, as you can see there, turning it into armor piercing for the majority of it. His spells change as well, getting in the Dragon's Breath spell. So overall, another good legendary lord with this ability of changing into a dragon for the melee combat, even though he's already quite good at it, even without the form. So, we have Transformation of the Dragon, which, guess what, turns him to, into a dragon as well. Where are you even checking? <laughs> then we have Mastery of the Elemental Winds, uh, increasing spell power when two or more units share this attribute. We also have Iron Scale, which is rather strange because it does give him regeneration, but also weakness to fire damage when he's actually a dragon. So, well, I, I don't know. Maybe they should review this part. Uh, he also gets a Ward in Iron, which gives uh, allies in range, including him, a Ward save of 5%. Not too much, but not bad. Not good. Just average. And then he has a master, he's master of alchemy, basically in human form, giving uh, an ally unit uh, magical attacks uh, or uh, more uh, uh, weapon damage, including more missile damage as well. And this subdivides into either the flaming, which gives it, guess what, flaming attacks and a little bit more weapon damage, or gives it a uh, uh, Armor piercing, because you're gonna get the piercing here, or gives us instead poison, so it can imbue with poison attacks, affecting all allies in range. Very decent. Uh, just make sure that you choose whichever you're uh, bound to to be using more, either more damage and flaming attacks, or maybe armor piercing, or maybe poison, regardless of which. Just make sure that you uh, do the decision with some thought process on it. The Dragon-Blooded Shugengan Lord, a spellcaster lord with either the lore of Yin or the lore of Yang. The Yin is illustrated here. Uh, not a lot of stats to fight in single combat, really. Low armor, low melee defense, a decent melee attack with magical attacks, but average weapon strength with not a lot of armor piercing. In essence, keep away from single combat unless you are fighting very low quality infantry or a similar weakened hero. So, for the Dragon-Blooded Shigengen Lord, you do have the Mastery of the Elemental Winds like others. Uh, this increases spell power when two or more units share this attribute. You also have the Will of the Dragons, which is basically a leadership increase, a small leadership increase in the area. Still nice. It's always nice when, when you get a little bit of uh, everything in, in, in the gameplay. Now, we have also a very interesting one, which is a bound spell. So you can choose whichever bound spell you want. So as in the Plague of Rust, the Spirit Leech, the Flock of Doom, or the Enfeebling Foe. So it's up to you which one you decide, but just remember that you have different uses of those. So this one, for instance, you only have one use. For this one, you have four uses. So just be careful of that, and of course, use the one that you're most likely going to, to be using in battle, and for a specific function, of course. And wearing a hat that would make any Chaos Dwarf envious, I mean, look at that thing, really cool. Uh, the Lord Magistrate. Although a melee lord, he's more of a support one, since his combat stats are really not that good. Low armor, average melee attack and defense values, not a lot of weapon strength or armor piercing weapon strength even there. So yeah, keep him away from combat, just close enough to support your troops. So... For the Lord Magistrate, he does have the Tactician and Grand Tactician, both, uh, they're, they're basically an improvement, so they give reload skill and melee defense, so uh, you can see this, this replace, same thing. He also has three other ones, very interesting ones, one is Inspired Assault, it gives a charge bonus and melee attack to a unit, decent range, 100 meters, it's always nice. Then you also have Inspired Defense, improving, guess what, melee defense, leadership, and also giving expert charge defense. And also we have the Inspired Markmanship 3, which is giving accuracy and reload skill, 
which is always excellent. And in addition, we do have the passive ability Will of the Dragons, affecting uh, allies in range with just a little bit more leadership, which is always nice. And for your first hero, a basic caster hero, the Alchemist. Not a lot in terms of combat stats, poor melee attack and melee defense values, poor weapon strength as well, not a lot of armor piercing either. So basically just keep her away from combat and do use her mainly f to cast spells, of course with a lore of metal to support your army in combat. So, for the Alchemist in campaign, he does have Mastery of Elemental Winds, she has Ele Mastery of Elemental Winds, with two or more units share this attribute, intensity increases for the power of the spells, which is always nice. She has Enchanted Metallurgy, which then subdivides and transforms into one of three. This imbues magical attacks and gives more weapon damage or base missile damage, but then you can choose whether or not whether to give it flaming attacks and a little bit more damage, or whether to give it more armor piercing with the, this one, so you, they're mutually exclusive, you have to, to choose. And then you can also choose for poison, so regardless of what you choose, just make sure that you uh, have a reason for it, maybe you want the poison, maybe you want more armor piercing, you're fighting against armored units, etc. The Astromancer is another caster hero, but this one with the lore of heavens to assist you in combat. A very damage dealing centric lore, basically. Now, it's he has a little bit better stats, but nothing to write home about. He can not engage in combat, still the same applies. Keep him away from combat if you can, and just take advantage of the benefits from his uh, lore of heavens. Gotrek, everyone's favorite dwarf. He's a powerful melee hero without any armor, with a ton of melee attack and good defense, as well as magical attacks. He also does quite a lot of armor-piercing damage with the hefty bonuses versus large, so he's great at taking out anyone, especially any large targets. In terms of abilities, he does have, of course, the typical Deadly Onslaught and Foe Seeker, and you also have the Rune Axe of Gotrak, which causes Dampen, removing magical attacks and spell resistance to enemies, and gives him 50% armor-piercing weapon damage. Gotrek's Doom also gives him 40 melee defensive, 40% ward save, which is excellent for him to survive. This is how he survives. In addition, he also has a Heroic Fortitude, a passive ability regeneration with only one use. If his hit points are really low, less than 10%, he has the chance of gaining hit points. And if it wasn't enough, he also has Death Blow, giving him a lot of weapon damage and armor piercing weapon damage when his hit points are less than 20%. So overall, an excellent fighter for your front lines. And by the way, he does have tons of hit points as well, which also helps. Felix, a decent melee hero, more of a support one. He has decent armor, but no shield, a good melee attack and melee defense values, and he also causes armor piercing missile damage and for the most part, and a bonuses versus infantry, so his main use uh, will be against other enemy infantry, or small targets, of course. Now, in terms of abilities, he does have Helping Hand, uh, a buff that gives 40 melee attack and ward safe to any lord or hero in 50 meters around him. It is great to ensure that they both survive and do additional damages, of course. Now, Karag Ghoul gives him flaming attacks and more melee attack and even further bonuses versus infantry, making him really good at taking out enemy infantry, regardless of how strong they are. And finally, we do have the Blood Oath. This is his particular skill. He gives regeneration generation to up to two lords or heroes in range while he's in melee. Therefore, Felix is an amazing support hero for your other lords or heroes. So we begin with Peasant Long Spearman, an anti-large, very expendable unit, not a lot in terms of other stats. They do have quite a hefty bonus as a large, so they'll do great against low quality cavalry, for instance, or you know any low quality monster that comes up. So they don't have a lot of melee attack or melee defense, it's mostly to get in the way while others finish the job, but they still they do have an interesting idea to him they to them they have an expert charge defense so they negate the charge bonus of any attacker they shouldn't be charging themselves because they don't have any charge bonus whatsoever you know three it's, it's not enough to warrant you know any charge for them and in addition in the late game and especially after research of the red line skills look at those stats they become quite a 
an average uh, unit. They become a tier 2 unit, for instance. Uh, you know, 40 armor, 37 melee attack, and 60 melee defense. That's quite powerful. So don't neglect these guys, uh, especially up, uh, into the, well into the mid game. They'll surprise you uh, as long as they are, uh, you know, getting upgrades for throughout the game and being supported. Uh, just don't count on, on, on beating anything, you know, anti-infantry you know, or beating any chosen, for sure. And now the first proper frontline unit, the Jade Warriors. These are sword and shield units, really uh, great armor and uh, the bronze shield. So they are also resistant to those missile attacks. They don't have a lot of melee attack, but they're definitely much better in melee defense. So just a holding infantry unit for sure. They do have that yang. They do have that defensive stance we spoke before. So uh, in the late game, they do become much better at holding the line for sure. You have to count on those stats all also increased with the um, with all the defensive stance and the yank so they'll definitely be much better uh, more than a tier 2 almost into a tier 3 unit for sure so the main idea here is that they don't get a lot of weapon strength so they are always much better in defending than they are on the offense and now for a variation, the Jade Warriors with Halberds, basically an anti-large and armor-piercing unit, much better in terms of their offensive capability, still with low melee attacks, so don't count on them doing too much damage, it's still better in melee defense, as you can see, so yeah, that's a particular reality of the... Um, of the Grand Cathay army, they're typically better at withstanding punishment rather than dealing damage, especially in their infantry units. So they do lack the shield, but still quite a decent amount of armor, so they're quite resilient, uh, most of the, the time, of course, against those large targets, monsters, cavalry units, maybe single entities of, of sorts. So in the late game, they become much better at that, with 44 melee attacks, 63 melee defense, those are really good stats. So they become much better at holding, you can definitely have these guys well into the late game, just be sure to keep them away from enemy missiles. And now for your elite unit, the Celestial Dragon Guard. They're still a halberd unit, armor piercing, much better damage, better melee defense and melee attack values, still the armor and the shield. So they are a no-brainer in terms of using these guys well into the late game. They're your best tier infantry. They'll be good against anything really. Just be careful because they don't have a lot of melee attacks, so don't count on them doing a lot of damage. Count on them surviving for quite some time. They still have that battle harmony, the Yang, so yeah. Definitely much better of a holding infantry rather than a damage dealer. Still, in the late game, they become much better than than that because of their increased melee attack, which is one of their weaknesses, and also their weapon strength increase. So definitely they become much better at a different role. Instead of just the holding infantry, a good attacking infantry in the late game, just be sure that you keep them away from anything that is very good against infantry, of course, because their primary targets, of course, is large units. And now for a regiment of renown, the Duden Dragons, the Celestial Dragon Guard Regiment. So they are still armor piercing and anti large, but they do have magical attacks, which makes them very good against any ethereal units, anything with physical resistance, such as demons, for instance. Still having that shield, still having that high armor, so very good, very good holding infantry. Of course, much better in melee attack because they do have increased stats with XP. Uh, in addition to that, they have the encourage ability, so they'll increase the leadership of nearby allies, which is always nice, and they. They also have immunity to psychology and a good spell resistance here. So a much tougher tanky uh, unit, really good against ethereal units, so be ready with, with this unit against those or just pinpoint anyone that has physical resistance, send them in, they'll do a good job. For your first missile unit, the Peasant Archers. Pretty much an expendable archer unit, very basic one, not a lot in terms of combat stats, so keep them away from any combat at all times. They do have quite a decent range, but still very poor missile strength, only one armor piercing, so this is kind of like goblin style. Uh, so yeah, definitely uh, just a, a very basic unit to get some skirmishing done against the, the enemies. Even in the late game, they just get a little bit better uh, range and a little bit more uh, missile strength, but not Nothing to shabby should replace these, of course, with some upgrades, but still very good for the early game.
Now for a slightly different missile unit, the, ha the Iron Hail Gunner, sorry. So these are armor-piercing missiles, but with a very close range. They're very good at wrecking stuff up from the, that close range. So just be careful because they are not that good in combat, so they should avoid combat at all times. Uh, and in essence, their biggest strength is precisely that, to maybe focus fire if the enemy makes the mistake of getting close to them, but not attacking them, actually, then you have a good counter to almost anything with that armor piercing missile in the late game they do have better uh, ammunition missile strength and lesser reload time so they'll be able to do more damage without uh, spending that much uh, time on the same target there's still uh, a lack of range increase so just be wary of that they're always going to need some protection against that those uh, melee units that try to to come after them or even against any missile units that focus fire them so be wary of that now to one of the staple units from the roster, the Jade Warrior Crossbowmen. These are basically much better in range than the Peasant Archers. They have quite good armor, still not a lot of melee attack or melee defense. So for the most part, they're just a little bit more resistance to anything that doesn't have any armor. So maybe they'll be able to resist some dogs or anyone that tries to, to move and, and, and kill them. But of course, uh, always ensure that they don't uh, keep in prolonged combat for too long. There may Main idea, of course, is to pepper the enemy with missiles. They do have that good range. Uh still significant armor piercing damage. Note that they do have initially very poor reload time which gets significantly improved in the late game. So uh, for the late game they get even better range, even better missile strength and reload time so making them quite effective well into the late game so you should be able to use these guys uh, with anything really. Just make sure you focus fire any hard targets or that you keep them away from any uh, combat and you'll be good. And then the variation, the Jade Warrior Crossbowman with shields. So pretty much the same unit, just they have that shield. So they'll be able to survive a little bit better against the missile attacks from the enemy, which is always nice to have a unit that can actually do this. So make sure that you bring these guys, especially against uh, armies that have a lot of missiles. If you're planning to invade those areas, just be sure that you put the, the shielded versions instead of the other. In the late game, they gain the same bonuses, so they'll become much better with that range specifically 184 it's really cool for a crossbowman unit so just that is already a good factor let alone the better missile strength and reload time so certainly a good unit in all cases in all scenarios now to a more specific specialist missile infantry, as it says there, the Crane Gunners. They do have a silver shield, although not a lot of armor, but they're very resilient against enemy missile attacks. Not a lot in terms of uh, combat stats, so please just keep them away from any combat. Their advantage is that uh, they have a lot of range, 275, that's nearly artillery level, so that's their main advantage. And they have armor piercing missile damage, also with shield breaker, so they're very good at defeating enemies that actually have shields or at least they're ensuring that you know they, they hit them and of course the all your crossbowmen will be able to do more damage all the, your the other units that you have the missile units will be able to do more damage so they're kind of a, like a good unit to have on a combo in the late game as you can see here they even gain more uh, range which is excellent 303 range that's nearly artillery level really so these guys will hit anything they'll still be able to do a lot of damage from afar uh, they're very good at picking up uh, single entities uh, very specific units because they're, they're kind of like sniper a sniper unit so that's their main usage but you can use them against anything a very good addition to any army and then for the prime of the prime of the missile units, the missile infantry, of course, the Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen. These are armored and shielded. They also have decent melee attack and melee defense, so they can survive a little bit in battle if needs be. Just don't put them in any front line. However, the biggest advantage is that their crossbows, somehow they do have armor piercing missile damage. So they're much better against any target, of course. They're just rather expensive in campaign, so be wary of that. But definitely into the late game, you should be fielding a little bit more of these guys than the other units uh, especially given their stats uh, increases in the late game as you can see there even more range more missile uh, damage especially armor piercing missile damage as you can see there and even better reload stats so in essence they'll be a menace to anyone that tries to face them uh, so if unless the enemy can deal with these guys with maybe flyers or flanking units definitely you'll have a good counter to most of what they're going to bring out 
We start off with Peasant Horsemen, a very cheap cavalry unit, very low quality tier 1 really. They have a lot of speed and charge bonus, so they're mostly a shock cavalry, not good stats in terms of melee attack or melee defense or even weapon strength, very low. So they do have an advantage of having vanguard deployment, so you can try to use these guys to go after enemy artillery or just to pursue routing enemies really. Uh, the main advantage of these guys is just that they're cheap and promptly available. In the late game they do become slightly better especially at their task uh, more speed more charge so definitely they'll they'll do a better job in that uh, still not enough stats to even be considered remotely as a melee cavalry especially because they always will have that low uh, hit point count and armor so definitely uh, just a unit that you'll be using for the early game to try and flank the enemy perhaps but not against anything really powerful of course now to a typical upgrade, actually, the Jade Lancers. Now these are armored and shielded, so they do have that shield. They're better at resisting enemy missile. Uh, not a lot of improvement in terms of weapon strength, just slightly better than the, pe the peasant ones, slightly better melee defense, but still pretty much predominantly a shock cavalry. It does state that they are anti-infantry, but that's mostly because of their stats. They don't have any uh, advantage uh, over there. They don't have any bonuses versus infantry, for instance. Just that Yang bonuses really... So, uh, in essence, in the late game, you'll be able to use these guys pretty much as the same. A shock cavalry that actually has some protection, uh, but never really a melee cavalry for certain. You'll always have to use these guys as shock cavalry. Uh, they get slightly better stats in terms of uh, the charge, the speed, uh, some more melee uh, uh, attack, but definitely not a lot of melee defense, so just be wary of that. Now to a very good, cool looking unit, the Great Longma Riders. They're armor then shielded, very tons of armor actually. Tons of speed as well, and decent melee attack and melee defense values. They also have a nice charge bonus, so they look like they'll be a good melee cavalry as well as, as shock cavalry. But Primarily you should use these guys for their shock value, just they are flyers so they'll always get the initiative, the shock. They're also good in the sense that they do cause fear, so that's also good to bring them into the flanks of enemies or their rear to ensure that they get the most out of the leadership penalties that they can inflict. Uh, but still, not a lot of weapon strength or armor piercing damage, so just be wary of trying to, to fight any armored opponents or any large opponents or anything that is anti-large, by all means no. Uh, in the late game, they do become much better at that task of shock cavalry, really. Uh, let me close up again. Of shock cavalry, really, but also good in terms of melee. So the, the main take the, that you should get from this is that the longer the game pro progresses and the longer that you upgrade these guys, the more you'll have to... Uh, to micro them less. Uh, sorry, the, the less you'll have to micro them. <laughs> that English. The less you'll have to micro them, so... Because mostly of the time you'll be able to just charge once or maybe twice and they'll be done with the enemy that you've told them. Just be sure to pick your enemies uh, wisely, of course. And now for a regiment of renown, the Righteous Lenses of Wei Jin. Great Longmar Riders ROR, still armored and shielded, very fast, good charge bonus, but the difference is that they are now armor piercing, which makes all the difference. These guys are really good at taking down armored opponents. For sure, it's it's sad that they are only an ROR unit. Definitely, the 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 faction would benefit from having an armor-piercing flying cavalry such as this one. Uh, another advantage is that they do also have the guardian ability, so they're very cool to keep, uh, you know, maybe to assist an enemy hero, uh, uh, your lord or hero, in fighting an enemy hero or lord, definitely. Uh, especially taking advantage of that speed and that charge bonus, and of course the armor-piercing. A very good addition to your forces. Now to your single entity, really, the Terracotta Sentinel. A monster for sure, armor piercing damage galore, that's one of the things that he has the best. Not a lot of melee defense, but a lot of melee attack and magical attacks. And he still has plenty of armor and he's unbreakable, so he'll never flee. This is basically a better improved giant, honestly. He has more armor, 
tons of melee attack as well. He's very good at taking out enemy single entities, as well as other infantry units, for instance. Uh, the main uh, issue with him, of course, is that he it may be vulnerable to any armor-piercing missiles. He's very slow, actually. It doesn't seem like from that speed, but he's very cumbersome, really. As it states here, the unit's attacks are slower than average. That's what they mean, because typically that's the main issue that you're going to have with this guy. Sometimes he's going to make an attack and it's going to take forever to do it. So, uh, another advantage is that it can cause terror. So it's a very good addition to your armies to ensure that you have someone that can cause terror and of course all the, the influences that it has in the gameplay. Now, in the late game he becomes really powerful. Much faster, which is always nice. Much better melee attack to the point that he gets 92 is crazy, he'll always hit definitely, and even better weapon strength and a little bit of physical resistance. So having some of these guys in your armies um, in the late game is always well deserved, they'll beat up most uh, enemies, of course a little bit of focus perhaps on uh, going against enemy single entities or any armored opponents for sure, or of course using taking advantage of that magical damage. And now to a regiment of renown, the Green Guardian, a terracotta sentinel that is actually a regiment of renown. Now the main difference is here, tons of more melee attack and better melee defense of course, but it relies mostly on his abilities. So he does have 25% missile resistance and this wonderful hex, which uh, basically when he is... Um, when the enemies are in range and there are missile units, he can redirect the projectiles back towards the firing unit. So definitely one unit that you shouldn't focus fire on, and you can send these, this guy against uh, the uh, a faction with a lot of missile units and they'll just crumble trying to, <laughs> to fire uh, at him. So that's always a, a niche aspect of, of the unit, but definitely a very good one. Still the same purpose, fight against enemy missile... Any, enemy single entities for sure, he's really good at it with tons of weapon strength and melee attack, but also take advantage of that armor piercing and magical attacks for any specific opponents that you may find. Now let's go to the Sky Lantern. First and foremost, they do have a Harmony Amplifier, so it means that the overall bonuses of Ying and Yang will be amplified just by the fact that this guy is around. Now, in essence, not a lot of combat stats, so make sure that you never, ever, ever put him in combat. They're worse than gyrocopters. The main advantage of these guys is actually the ranged attack. Very good range. They do have crane gunners there, so that's basically what you get. Uh, decent ammunition and missile strength, of course, that's really good. And it's armor piercing and it causes shield breaker. So try to focus fire those targets that actually have shields so you get, get the most of it. It's definitely good to have a couple of sky lant lanterns just for this shield breaker ability. Perhaps put it on a lord. It's kind of like giving the lord a, a worse shield which is really nice. Uh, in addition to that they are always flying. They cannot land of course. They're firing whilst moving which is always decent. And they do have the eye of the dragon. This ability allows them to spot enemies in the forest and also it gives the uh, leadership a little bit of leadership to your uh, friendly allies nearby they are a yin unit so of course it's very good because they're flyers they can hover your yang units and of course increase their 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 stats which is also a nice uh, idea now in the late game they just become better in terms of the Overall uh, missile strength, of course, they get a little bit more range, more missile strength. Uh, also, some improved stats that are negligible, but the speed, for instance, is actually a good one so that you can, you know, stay out of harm's way if they need to. Just be sure to cover them up against enemy flyers because, of course, you know, they can't defend themselves for anything. <laughs> And your second flying artillery unit, basically the Sky Junk. Uh, basically, they do have good armor and good leadership, but <laughs> terrible combat stats. Don't put them in combat anyways. They still have the Harmony Amplifier, so it's really good to ensure that your and uh, your units get a little bit more buffs with the Yin-Yang mechanic, and they are uh, Yin units, so that's cool. Get some Yang units around. Um, the main purpose, of course, is this: they, they are an arm, uh, basically an artillery unit. They have a lot of range. Fire ammunition and that missile strength is really good, explosive, gets a 
lot of shots, so they're basically a rocket in wings, really. Now, they also cannot uh, land by any means. If they land, they die. It's because they're dead. <laughs> they do have that Eye of the Dragon, so first spotting and leadership, of course. And they do have the Sky Junk Bomb. So they can act as a bombardment unit. Very good explosive damage, three uh, charge of this still decent armor piercing damage so yeah definitely if the enemy doesn't have any counter any missiles or any flyers by all means you can just put them over them but if they do have just be wary because they'll, they'll die very fast now in the late game of course they become a much better artillery unit you know really much better range more missile strength better reload time i wish there was a little bit more of that they do get uh, more speed so at least they can a little bit to the scene uh, if they need to more melee attack and more melee defense although well that's basically it negligible really you should never put them in combat against anything even bats will, will take them out so for sure the main purpose of these guys just to serve as a, a flying platform uh, getting a lot more uh, damage to the to the enemy units of course uh, and just make sure that you keep them out of harm's way ever all the time just keep them away <laughs> your first artillery unit the grand cannon they do have fire ammunition which is always nice and a good amount of range so they're good at uh, sniping out enemy artillery units enemy single entities they do have armor piercing missiles which is rather good not a lot of in terms of reload time so they do take uh, their time in firing but still very good against single entities uh, you know single targets but you can also use them against infantry or it's very versatile unit for sure Th that's definitely what i would like to say of course as always as any artillery unit just keep them out of harm's way they'll die really fast and very very inefficiently as well now in terms of the late game they of course become much better in their uh, stats especially in terms of missile strength and in reload time which is always very good they gain a little bit more ammunition so you kind of don't need to be worried about ammunition for them for the most part which is excellent just bring a couple of these guys to get uh, on those single targets get their those artillery units or anything really they'll very versatile and always a good addition to your army now to a unit that every Empire uh, player really likes, the Fire Rain Rockets. So, in essence, they don't have a lot of ammunition, but they do have good range. And the missile strength is really tremendous. They have a lot of volleys. It's excellent to use against infantry. It doesn't say in the card, but it's excellent to use against infantry. They'll fire several projectiles. They'll hit really well. So, definitely that's their main purpose, to fire on blobs of infantry, of missile infantry. They'll wreck them, especially from quite afar. They do have good range now in the late game of course they become much better at doing this the biggest advantage is of course they get better reload speed and a little bit more uh, missile strength so it's only lacking that they don't get any more range which is one of the poor aspects of it basically it's still 400 still very good but more range always is helpful especially when you gain it in, in during the campaign but still they're very good bring a couple of them to deal with blobs of infantry missile units they'll do their job just really nicely now to a very interesting unit, the very last unit of the roster, the Wu Jing War Compass. My apologies if I mispronounce it. They do have that harmony amplifier, so it does increase the harmony levels of yin and yang. Uh, but the main advantage is that they have two charges of uh, bombardment spells, the Celestial Comet and the Celestial Lightning. So they're very good as a spellcaster in itself. It's really awesome to have. In addition, they do give the... Uh, the power recharge increase uh, passively so they are very good to bring with additional spellcasters and they also have the mastery of elemental winds uh, this is when two or more units with this army with this uh, attribute are in the same army the intensity increases the power of the spells so of course bringing extra casters or bringing extra units with the mastery of elemental winds make sure that these spells always get the maximum uh, amount of damage possible now this is still a chariot unit but not a lot in terms of stats so just keep them away 
from combat. They do have decent weapon strength, but yeah, for by all means, their purpose is not to, to bring out in combat. In the late game, they do get better stats, especially in terms of combat as well, so they'll survive a little bit better. Still not enough for you to, to get them into to melee. They're more of the spell casting. Uh, the only addition is that maybe in the very latest stages of the battle, after you spend those charges, maybe you can use these guys to, to get into that, that combat, of course. They do have uh, quite surprising missile resistance in the late game, so uh, that's also a good aspect. You won't be as vulnerable to enemy missiles, of course. But for the most part, a very interesting spellcaster that you can bring out, a chariot spellcaster, really, to or to help your other spellcasters. Uh, but for the most part, that's their their idea. You could maybe bring out... I, I wish they would have fear, for instance, or maybe anything like that. But, well... It seems they don't. So, yeah. Main abilities to use the spells, and then in the very late game, maybe you charge them around to see if the enemy runs. And there you go. All the units from Cathay, before and after research, redline skills and XP, and all the lords. I do hope that you guys enjoy this and that this helps you guys to prepare a little bit better for combat with them. So, yeah. Thank you very much for, for you guys for watching. Whoa! There goes the guy, and <laughs> there goes the sentinel. So yeah, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.